Welcome to Lekable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza. Uh, and you can join us for Lekable Science, where we try to help people understand that science is an integral and fun and interesting part of their lives. Joining me today from Wesleyan University in Connecticut is uh, Sandy Becker, and she's going to help us talk about sort of what I've called the, the nitty gritty of science. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you. Here I am. <laughs> so Sandy has worked uh, at Wesleyan for many years uh, as a developmental biologist in a, in a lab there. She earlier worked as a civil service test writer in California. She was a fifth grade teacher in Hawaii for a while, and uh, apparently has been even a folk singer. <laughs> also does a little freelance science writing on the side. But I, I wanted to get her on because oftentimes I think we, we think about science from the viewpoint of the, the PIs in the lab, that the, the leaders of the lab who have the big, big ideas and are not sort of in the lab every day doing the work. And I thought it would be uh, interesting and, and for our audience to, to get to hear from somebody who really is, is sort of in the trenches every day. So maybe because I'm not sure how uh, our audience might, how familiar they are with sort of an academic research lab, maybe, uh, Sandy, you can tell us a little bit about sort of the, the general structure of, the, of these labs. Well, I assume you mean the personnel structure, right. not not what the lab looks like with the shelves and bottles. Right? Exactly. Okay. Well, as you mentioned, there is a principal investigator, which we call the PI, um, who is the head of the lab and runs the lab. Uh, larger labs have postdoctoral fellows who um, also do research and probably hope to leave in a few years and start their own lab. Now, at a place like Wesleyan, where I work, PIs have to do a lot of things other than do science. They have to teach, which is a big production, and they have to write grants to get funding to run the lab. Um, well, you can imagine, we, we have graduate students and undergraduates also. Now, I was called a research technician. That means that I do the experiments. I set up experiments. I train the uh, other people to do the experiments and how to do the procedures. And in my case, um, I have been in Laura's lab almost as long as she has. So an added value is I know what we've done in 1992, right. and I know what things we tried that were a complete flop, and you might as well not try that again unless you have a new idea. I know where old data is stored in a deep, deep freezer in case we want to look at it with a pair of fresh eyes. Exactly. So you're sort of, in a, in a sense, the organizational memory in a way, because you really know all the processes, the procedures, how, how the lab really runs, what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's, that's so critical. That's, uh, you know, oftentimes a PI with their sort of high-level view doesn't, may not know all the, the details about how actually things get done every day in the lab. Um, and so it, it's, it, I think it's an incredibly uh, important uh, and valuable position. So tell me a little bit then about, about sort of what, what would a, a typical day of yours look like? Well, um, one thing we do on a routine basis in this lab is grow cells. We grow embryonic stem cells of both mouse ones and human ones, and they need to be taken care of every day. They're like infants. <laughs> uh, not quite as bad as an infant. You have to take care of it every few hours. The cells we need to take care of every day, including on weekends, they need to be fed. <laughs> Um, we harvest mouse embryos for research. We extract RNA. Um, I do immunostaining, which is staining cells with a fluorescent marker. Analyze the results. I spend some time reading the literature in my field. Um, I spend some time training newer people. Right. Graduate students and undergrads at a place like Wesleyan, which is primarily an undergraduate institution. Uh, we have undergrads in the lab. 
also, I'm known to be good with spelling and grammar, so I am often asked to proofread stuff other people have written and put the commas in the right place. <laughs> no, that's, that's incredibly valuable. Scientists, uh, I think, as a, as a group, are not always the world's best writers. They write in long, convoluted, passive voice sentences and uh, sometimes need a good editor on to help m make them understandable. You know? uh, so that, that's, uh, so it seems like, again, your job involves a lot of different kinds of tasks. Probably no two days are quite like one another. Uh, Absolutely there, there, true. Yeah, there are some themes that sort of run through your days. And, and what, what, uh, what parts of your work you really enjoy the most, sort of? Oh, doing immunostaining. Okay. I just love doing staining, yep. partly because the data comes out so beautiful. In fact, I've sometimes used immunofluorescent lab data for my Christmas card. That's right, and I think we have a, an image here, right? And I think I'm, I provided a picture oh. of my Christmas card. Yes, uh, that's not, not, not quite available yet, but, but we're going to get to it in, in a second or two here, I guess, in a few seconds. Okay. But yes, the, the immunostaining is a nice technique where, again, it, it makes... Uh, it both gives you information, but it also creates really beautiful images, right? Yes, it does. I mean, what you'll see when you see it is green. <laughs> um, cells which have been stained with a green marker that finds all the, a protein in all the cells, mm -hmm. so they all turn a beautiful fluorescent green. Yeah. Well, I thought it made a very nice Christmas card, and then I put some red stars on it, which you'll see. Yes. Here we go. Here, here, here is this image now. Yeah, so you can see, uh, your, your viewers can see this green background, with each little green dot there basically being... Uh, oh, they can see it, but I can't? Right. They can see it, but you can't, right. Uh, but, okay. but this is, this is the one that has the, these nice little... Uh, you can see where the stars are. Each, okay. Each star is sort of... So, surrounded by a, uh, a little cluster yes. of cells. You can see that the stars, each star, which I put there with Photoshop. Okay. That was your Christmas card version, right? Is surrounded by a kind of a wreath of cells which are sort of shaped like daisy petals. They're long and thin. And if you look closely at the stars, each one of them is surrounded by a wreath. And we call those wreaths neural rosettes, because only neurons, neural cells, make them. Right. And uh, so if you could show the next, right, next image with the Christmas decorations taken away, right. you can see this better. Yes, there we go. So they've, they're now seeing this next image. And you, you can, can see now that there's a, there's a dark spot in the middle of each of this wreaths, wreath-like things. Right. And we think in the lab that these neural rosettes are a good model for the way that the, the neural tube develops in the embryo because we think they're kind of a two-dimensional model, like a slice, a cross-sectional slice through the neural tube. Hmm. And we use the cells growing in the dish as a model for the way that the neural tube develops. Right. So this is looking at very, very early growth of the nervous system then, at the, at the, at yes. the very earliest stages. Yes, and quite that, early stages in the embryo. Right. And of course, that's, that's a huge issue is how something as complex as the nervous system develops from a, a, an embryo with only a few cells. And you're looking at a very interesting uh, early stage there where there's just enough cells that are starting to change and split into different roles. And so those, that, those cells have changed in their form, it becomes the, that elongate shape that you referred to, and are beginning to take on a specialized function now. Yes. Yeah, well, I've explained it to you. I hope I've explained it to the rest of the audience. <laughs> in, indeed, indeed. That's, that's great. So um, beyond uh, uh, working in an in a academic lab, you've also spent time in, uh, in a in, uh, commercial laboratory. And I, I'm wondering about, again, there's, this gives you some very interesting background that uh, uh, many people do not have. And, and can you maybe talk a little bit about sort of the, the differences, how, how, how the two experiences compare? 
Well, it was pretty different. I did spend three years in uh, working for a small biotech company in Massachusetts. And one thing is definitely true. They paid me a ton more money, <laughs> like twice as much money, plus stock options. Uh -huh. Well, that's good. Uh, you definitely make more money. But for me, the marginal utility of money drops off pretty fast after a certain point. Mm -hmm. I mean, enough's enough. And the work is different, and for me, it wasn't as much fun, so I came back okay. to Laura's lab at Wesley. See, the purpose of a company is to make money. Right. And the best way for a biotech company to make money is to come up with something that has a medical value that's medically useful. Right, so what were like you working on? Like a cure on? for macular degeneration. That was what they were working on. I see. And they may do it. Mm -hmm. And I hope they do, because I still own stock in that company. There we go. <laughs> um, but the role of a scientist is to find stuff out. Now, I admit, an academic scientist has to get grant funding, mm -hmm. and granting agencies really would like your stuff to have your ideas to have medical relevance. But the medical relevance can be farther into the future. Indeed. Um, Yes. And what you end up doing every day is more focused on finding stuff out and less focused on um, getting an initial, what is it, in investigational new drug application approved, uh -huh. IND. Yeah, so there's uh, sort of, in a sense, a more freedom in, in an academic lab to pursue the interesting questions that arise, right? Because, yes. because you never know. I mean, the, the whole nature of experiments is you don't, you don't know the outcome at the start. And so when you get a puzzling outcome, you, you may pers pursue it one way or, or follow, it, follow differently. Whereas in a more uh, sort of a, a product-driven laboratory, you, you don't have that freedom always. You're always looking to get to the same spot to, to get your IND application out, right? Yeah. That's yeah, so that, that, that freedom is, is indeed a, a real plus of the academic world, uh, to, to go where the, where the experiments take you, as it were. I, I agree. Right. And that, that must be, in a sense, one of the, one of the, again, one of the very nice points about your, your, uh, your role, because you are very, uh, very close to the data, because you, you, set, you set up the experiments, you run the experiments, you train the students to run the experiments. You get to see the data sort of as it rolls off uh, and can tell right away in some cases, I'm sure, like this is very, this is interesting data, it, it confirms my ideas, or it's very interesting because it, it goes against what we were expecting, right? Yes, that, that's an important feature of my job rather than the PI's job. I get to see the data directly, and the PI is too busy writing grants and teaching, among other things, to get to look at all the data first. Um, the PI is kind of dependent on me and the students, other people in the lab, postdocs if there are any, to tell them about the data. Exactly. So they get it sort of secondhand. <laughs> exactly. So you, right, you're, you're, you have that firsthand uh, look at it, and that, that's a wonderful thing. So we're going we're gonna to take a little break right now. Uh, I'm uh, your host, Ethan Allen, on Likeable Science. Uh, I'm talking today with Sandy Becker from Wesleyan University. She's a developmental biologist there. And we're talking about the nitty gritty of doing science. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do and that's what I'm here to do on this show. That's Center Stage. It's on every Wednesday from 2 to 3 o'clock. I hope to see you there. And you're back on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. 
we're talking about the nitty-gritty of science today. And with me via Skype is Sandy Becker, a developmental biologist from Wesleyan University. She uh, is a, a key sort of organizational memory, uh, being a research technician in her laboratory there. She has, uh, knows where uh, all the data is stored, knows where uh, the procedures that have worked, the ones that haven't worked, who's been through the lab, what lab has done successfully, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. But before you became a, uh, before you got into your uh, developmental biology work, Sandy, you had also uh, been a teacher for a while, and th that's a rather different role. But you had you had a sort of an interesting experience in a, in a sense, I gather, that sort of gave you a little foretaste of science with, uh, <laughs> when you were working. Uh, I I did. Um, I mean, one of the big differences between doing science and teaching anything, including science, is at least at the level I was at, I was teaching fifth grade. And in fifth grade, you kind of assume that the teacher knows stuff and the kids are there to learn stuff. And you don't do a lot of, let's find this out together kinds of things. But in my class, we ended up accidentally doing a let's find it out kind of experiment. Uh, my husband, who was then in medical school, brought home a pair of mice from the school. Uh, the male mouse was mouse colored, you know, kind of grayish, the way mice are. Mm -hmm. And the female mouse was white, like lab mice often are. So I thought, fine. I'll take these mice to school and we'll start a little mouse colony and we'll do genetics experiments, mm -hmm. just like Gregor Mendel and his bees. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I knew just about enough genetics at that point to know that the, the wild mouse mouse color is dominant and the white color is recessive. Right. So I thought we'd get the first litter would be all mouse colored babies and after that, we'd get kind of a mixture of, of gray ones and white ones. Right, exactly. Very some, sensible, some right? Some gray and some white. It turns out that the mouse coat color genetics is way more complicated than that. <laughs> we got spotted mice. We got black mice. We got brown mice. We got a kind of a beige <laughs> colored mouse. I, the children and I were totally confused. Right. Because I, you know, I had kind of told them what to expect, <laughs> and we were not seeing what we expected, and there was not any possibility that there was any kind of um, fooling around going on. These mice were in a cage. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. But... Uh, but the kids just loved it. They, they really, they enjoyed the fact that their teacher didn't turn out to know everything. Right. No, and I... they enjoyed the fact that they were struggling to find something out. This. This course is, uh, is they felt like scientists. Yeah, this is, a, and it's kind of too bad that uh, you know there's not more room in classroom teaching for that kind of stuff. Well, I, I was going to say this. This is actually now becoming more the trend in classrooms is to to have the teacher not not assume automatically that role of of the, the one who knows, but to be a, a co-explorer with the kids. And well, that's great. You you were just you I mean, were just this ahead was of your, in 1968. Right, you were ahead of your time there uh, for for doing so, that. Um, but they find, of course, that basically that makes that gives the kids a much more active role in, in the learning process. They own their knowledge much more than being fed the knowledge, and that gets them more involved in it in many cases. And so it's it's becoming, a, a, I think, a more popular idea. So you, you that's that's interesting to know that you were uh, you were moving. Uh, Moving, moving along there, you know. Um, so, uh, but, but this get, gets you, uh, but gets us back to this question of, of again, looking at data and uh, uh, dealing with the, because the, the, you were, you were, your data in this case was mice of all these different colors and coat patterns and all. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes, of course, you have data like that that, yeah, you don't know what to do with. But uh, I suspect that's less generally true in, in the day-to-day the, the -day work of your lab. But beyond that, you also you work very closely with the, uh, uh, the students, uh, you mentor students, um, 
you said you help people with editing and all. Uh, you, you have to work with the PIs. You presumably work with the whole, the whole sphere of, of people. You work with the data. So you told us earlier sort of what you really enjoyed the most. So what's, what's sort of the, the downside of your work? What's, what's one of your least favorite things? Um, well, we need another image. We're okay. going to need another image for this. You, I think we should. One of the things that, that I have to do is analyze the data. You know, you get a pretty picture like the one I showed you, and I will show you another one. Right. Here, here, here's our Christmas card from another year. Okay. Here's another Christmas card. Right. And you'll notice that in this case, some of the, most of the cells are green, little, little tiny dots. Those represent green cells, but you see a few of them are red. And they have long squiggly, squiggly processes. Right. That shows that they're neurons. That's what we call those axons right. or processes. If, yes, now I'll show this without, without the decorations on them. They can see now, more clearly. Now take away the, the right. Christmas decorations. Right. And what we want to know here is how many of the cells we grew turned out turned became neurons as we grew them in the dish but some of them is not a good enough answer mm -hmm. you have to say i have to say what percentage how many and that means i have to count them one by one okay. count the red ones and then count all the green ones right. now look at those green ones carefully does that look like fun <laughs> That, that could be a, 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 a long and tedious process, yes. And you have to do it in order for it to be, you have to make sure that you've counted a statistically significant sample. Right. And that means you have to count not just a field like that, right. but say three or four fields like that. Right. And that field had thousands and thousands of cells in it. So. And, and you may easily end up counting thousands of cells. And right. even though it's not like I have to count them in my mind, one, two, three, four, five, six, up to, you know, 4,782, there is, we do have a, a counting program on the computer, but it still is me that has to hit that little button right. for, to represent every cell. And that part I did not enjoy. <laughs> I empathize. Uh, there, were, uh, there are parts of when I was, was doing science that, yes, I found very, very tedious. I used to do uh, histology or cutting sections, of course, and I found, to my mind, that was a that got very old very fast, particularly when you had to pull the sections out and start staining them and move them through the sets of solutions and make the slides and repeat that process seemingly an infinite number of times. Uh, Were they frozen sections? I, I did. Yeah. A little bit of frozen work, but ma mainly I actually did uh, uh, embedded sections. Frozen sections have also the, the feature that your hands begin to freeze. All right. Yes, working a cryostat is, has, has its its own uh, painful aspects. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, so th this is the kind of stuff that that brings you that 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 you don't like, and that we've seen things that you do like too. Um, what, what do you, what sort of keeps you coming back to, to the lab each day? What, what is it that you really, that, that, that drives you, uh, that, that, that makes, makes you want to keep being involved in science? Curiosity. <laughs> okay. That's I want to see how my experiment came out. That's true. Once, once you set this all in motion, right, you've got, you got you to wait and see what the results are. Uh, and then that, usually, of course, every good experiment, right, generates more questions for you, right? If, if this one worked this yes, way, then... Yes, almost always. Yes. A, an experiment, a, a set of experiments almost always generates another set of questions. Right. And Absolutely. That, and that's, so that, that really is, in, in a sense, it's this constant, sort of constant, never-ending search that, that as, mu as many times you get a good answer or a bad answer, you, you, that just drives further uh, searches for more answers. Um, have, uh, have you faced uh, barriers in your career that you feel? No. None. 
Okay, well, that, that, that's, that's excellent to hear. Uh, there, there are... I mean, if, if you're looking for some way to report some kind of gender discrimination, um, my parents never clued me in that this might be a possibility, so I didn't expect it and haven't encountered it. No, that's, that's wonderful. I've heard other people comment sort of the same thing. If, if you have sort of good role models and, and good, uh, good parenting in an early age where the, the doors are always open and you know the doors to your learning are, are essentially boundless, that yes, you, you seem less likely to encounter these. Uh, but it, not, nonetheless, in science, not so much in biology, but in many fields of science, women are significantly underrepresented and, and apparently do get closed out at, at some level in some way. Through, through whatever whatever forces may be, uh, but uh, that's that's a whole I guess a whole different different topic there. Um, it's it's certainly certainly uh, true in computer science and engineering. Um, so uh, let sort of let's briefly start looking ahead here. Where do where do you see sort of academic research going? How do you see it changing in the future? Well, I'm pretty sure there's going to be more and more of the work being done by computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it's great in many ways to have computers doing stuff that they can do in some time, some ways better than we can, we humans, still I have a concern that computers are a garbage in, garbage out kind of situation. And I think it's important for the, the ultimate responsibility for putting the right, asking the right questions still lies with us. Right, right. The, the, the PI has to sort of frame the question and know it's a reasonable question and along with the other staff in the lab be able to look at the results and sort of say yes, these are reasonable results or no, these aren't and frame all that out because the computer really can't do that part of the work. Uh, but computers, of course, and, and lab automation in the broader sense is, has been absolutely invaluable, of course, in the progress of science. Uh, the, all the genetics work could never have been done if, if people, if students were still there individually by hand, uh, yeah. pulling out DNA and sequencing chromosomes one at a time laboriously over years, right? Uh, uh, right. Uh, so, so in that sense, it, it's been a, a very powerful, uh, uh, very powerful aid to to, uh, to science. But you, you, I mean, you're quite right. It, it's it always needs to be watched rather closely and to be sure that the uh, the lab automation, the computing power, is sort of serving the science well, helping address the the, the key questions, being overcoming as or the, the the barriers may limit us our speed, our coordination, our uh, visual acuity, what have you, um, and uh, that it's not just generating random data in a sense, right? So um, this is great. We are uh, at a point where we're going to take another break here in just, just a moment, and then we're going to come back and uh, talk a little bit more about sort of what, what you see, how you see people should be preparing for uh, careers in science and, and the, their, your views on that since you ha you've had a, a long successful career in science. You're on Lakeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. I've been talking with Sandy Becker here about the nitty gritty of do doing science and we're going to continue it right after a break. We'll be right back. Aloha, this is uh, Martin Despang, uh, host, co-host of the Urban Transcendence Show by Alejandra Yamashita and Martin Despang. And me being an architect and an educator in architecture, I'm really interested in that we make our uh, urban environment here in downtown Honolulu and Honolulu as exciting, invigorating, and challenging, be beautiful as our wonderful paradise natural environment. I'm going to bring in guests. We're going to bring in guests from a diversity of areas that help us to learn how we can achieve that goal that um, shouldn't be that hard to reach. So we look very much forward to see you then. Thank you. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're broadcasting here from the, the tech studios in Pioneer Plaza. 
Uh, with me today talking about the nitty gritty of science is Sandy Becker from Wesleyan University. Sandy has uh, worked in a lab there for 35 years as a developmental biologist and uh, has a vast repertoire of experiences and expertise here. And I, I want to explore a little bit with you, Sandy, uh, about how we can get uh, students prepared to, to move into science. There are, of course, concerns that the U.S. isn't producing enough scientists these days. And um, so I just wanted to sort of get, get your, think about, your thinking about what sort of are the key steps that students might take to keep uh, science careers open to them, you know? Well, I certainly think they should take statistics right. so That's they will be, be able popular. to be properly uh, skeptical about statistical claims that they encounter or that they make. Mm -hmm. And they should, you know, know enough math so they can mix up their solutions correctly and know when their calculator has misplaced the decimal point. Right. And I'm saying this in a kind of a testy tone of voice, you may have noticed, because we've had, you know, undergraduates, and Wesleyan is a very selective school. These are not, you know, these are very well-prepared kids who don't realize when their math doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's really important to be able to know when your math doesn't make sense. Right. If you're, if you're supposed to add... 10 milliliters of a solution to a uh, another solution, and instead you're trying to add 10 liters, it's going to make quite a difference. Right. In, That's a big difference. You know, in the size beaker you need. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of devices at our disposal now, but it's up to us to, to know what to do with them and to know if they are serving us accurately. Indeed. And, it, you know, it's one of the, the things that they... Uh, uh, they find that our K-12 education system does not do particularly well in, in math is prepare kids with that sense of sort of reasonableness, uh, uh, an, an estimation, that ability to estimate whether like, gee, that's a sensible sort of answer or no, that, that answer is utter, utter and complete nonsense, you know. Um, we don't tend to build that kind of, of thinking very much into our early math uh, courses, apparently. And it's, you were pointing out it's just absolutely critical as, as a key it's step. It's really important, I think. Yeah. You have to know how to add. You don't even really have to know how to add and subtract anymore because you're, this little gadget will do it for you. Right. But you have to know when to add and subtract. Right. And as you say, what's, what's reasonable to, to realize that, yes, if you, if you work for you know, $20 an hour for 10 hours, you're not going to get $2 billion. That's not a reasonable answer, right? Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so, but, but beyond sort of the, the formal courses here, so you said statistics, which I'm sure makes a lot of students probably moan and groan, because uh, it's never, never a popular course, and, and mathematics, which is probably about on the same level. What other sorts of, of skills do you think students should really hone, and what sorts of attitudes should they sort of work on developing that are going to get them through in science? They should learn how to cook. <laughs> learn how to cook, all right. Well, doing the actual process of doing science is a lot like cooking. You follow, we call them protocols, but they're really recipes. Right. You follow a protocol to do your experiment, but it's really just like a recipe. Uh -huh. And when you've had some experience, then you know when you have to follow it down to the last little teaspoon or milliliter, as the case may be, and when you can sort of improvise. And, you know, try a little smoked paprika instead of the ground-up pepper. Mm -hmm. Huh. So that, 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 that's, that's a great one, I, I suspect. I am, I am pretty sure that some of my success as a scientist is due to being a good cook. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, that, that, no, that, that's wonderful. And uh, that, that's certainly a, a key set of skills, certainly, for, for a scientist to have. And... What, what about attitudes? Curiosity well, okay. and skepticism. Right. And skepticism is important, especially in the lab setting. It can be hard to maintain it because yeah. you come as a student and you are, as an undergraduate or even as a graduate student, you come into a lab 
and you are the newest, greenest, most ignorant person there. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to maintain a, an attitude of saying, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. If right. it doesn't. Because or, right. you, you, you know, you, you sort of but I think it's really important. Yes, you sort of, there, there's sort of a subtle pressure for you to agree with the, 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 the sort of the, the dogma of the lab, as it were, about how, how things work, what, what should be happening, why, why the experiments are going the way they are. And you're saying that it's, it's better for you to, be, to question that all the time and, and, and not, take, not take that stuff on faith, as it were. Yes, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure there are people who know me who are going to watch this and they're going to be groaning <laughs> that, that I am um, leading, leading people down the primrose path here, but uh, somebody has to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And in a sense, it's, it's sort of the, the, the new kids, the outsiders who are really in the best position to do that because they can ask those questions very sort of honestly, very naively. You know, yes. why, why do you do it this way? Well, what if you did it the other way? Well, what might happen if we did, boom, you know? That's, that's often the case, and that a new person coming in asking uh, a perfectly innocent question, when you find yourself trying to answer it, you may think of things that you wouldn't have thought of if they hadn't asked you that perfectly innocent question. Right, so then it's, then it's the job of the more senior personnel in the lab to be open to those questions and not dismiss them out of hand, but to, to honestly consider them and try their best to answer them fully and completely. And I know another thing you mentioned was uh, a sense of humor uh, as, a, as being an important uh, aspect and in, in an attitude to cultivate. Well, you know, science is often very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Things go wrong, right and left. You know, we grow, when you grow cultured cells, from time to time, they become contaminated with bacteria. And you have to throw them away and start all over. From time to time, they just won't behave themselves in the way that you have come to expect. Um, just a, a great many things can go wrong. And you have to have a certain amount of resilience in the face of frustration. Absolutely. I was going to say a sense of perse perseverance, I think, is probably a critical uh, attribute to surviving in science. Well, uh, that, too. As well. Uh, that, you uh, have to be willing to do it again. Right. You have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing because, yes, it may fail. It may fail again. It may fail a third and fourth and fifth and sixth time. But uh, if you keep pushing at it, uh, hopefully sooner or later you'll, you'll succeed. Um, so what is it that you think, uh, you know, students, what advice would you give sort of incoming students that, that essentially a standard, you know, counselor, uh, guidance counselor couldn't, couldn't tell them, wouldn't tell them about academic research as, as a, as a uh, following, as a career? Hmm. Well, I think high school guidance counselors are likely to advise promising students to go to graduate school and get a PhD mm -hmm. and and become a, a PI, become a principal investigator. Mm -hmm. But that might not be the most fun for them. Um, right. PIs, at least in, in the setting that I've worked in, which is a small university that is mostly an undergraduate university but has some graduate programs, PIs have to spend a lot of time teaching, not doing research. And if teaching is what you like, fine. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, then this might not be what you want. Right. Uh, they have to spend time writing grants. Right. Or writing articles. And I've, I've never heard anybody say if they liked writing grants <laughs> so far. Um, Sometimes writing up articles with your research, that can be sort of fun because it, it, you re, it makes you realize you've done it, mm -hmm. that you've come up with something that you can put into a convincing article. Right, right. That's not so bad. Mm -hmm. 
I, I always refer. Right. I always refer to grant writing as a, a sort of peculiar form of science fiction, right? Where you, you're sort of crafting the story and sort of saying, well, now, if we had a lot of resources of the right sort, then, you know, this, this exciting thing might happen. But, uh, <clears throat> but there, it's still true that the person who really gets to do the experiments is me. Right. Yeah. The technician. Right. Well, the graduate students and, and postdocs, they get to do the experiments, too. Right. But, but the person who's already got the PhD and is running their own lab um, has a lot of other demands on their time. Mm -hmm. And they have to be a, a good colleague, a member, you know, they're a member of a department. Right. And they have to serve on committees. and They have to serve on committees. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think my job is more fun. And they sometimes, if the fact that they don't get to see the data firsthand can be a problem. It's a physical impossibility for the PI to look at all the data firsthand. Mm -hmm. Because we spend, I and the graduate students and the undergrads spend a lot of time staring in a microscope right. of one kind or another. And you, the, the PI is, is at the mercy of our eyes, mm -hmm. and I, I like to do it myself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I admit that that might be my prejudice. I fix my own car, too. Oh, that's very impressive. Uh, well, I did when I had old cars. <laughs> I was going to say, it, it gets to be trickier these I, days. I don't. More, yeah. and more, more, more of them have more and more computer control. It's harder, harder to fix them, but... I fix my own leaky faucets, so maybe I'm, I'm just the kind of person who wants to um, do it myself. Yes, indeed. Uh, it'd be, uh, it's, uh, my, uh, my wife actually does the same thing. She, she does our plumbing and, you know, she'll fix, fix the faucets when they leak and, you know, get all that stuff done. So uh, that's, that's interesting to hear. Um, so, if you had to give to, uh, aspiring students what, one piece of advice, what, what would that be, Dan? One piece of advice? One piece of advice. Think like a five-year-old. <laughs> okay. My five-year-old grandson, Zane, is the perfect example of the scientist, the scientific mind. Mm -hmm. He is curious about absolutely everything, and he's not afraid to say, Hey, wait a minute, Grandma, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the perennial why, right? That's, that's sort yes, of... Yes, little kids are always asking why. Right, which, which is what a, a scientist, of course, must be doing in, in a only slightly more sophisticated way, right? That's true. That's true. We, we have to ask it in more detail, and sometimes we have to go through a lot of frustrating drudgery in order to find the answer. But, but that's fundamentally what we're doing. We're, we're just, just, just being, yeah, just being five-year-olds in, in a sense as, as scientists, right? Excellent. Well, this, this has been wonderful talking with you. I certainly appreciate your joining me here on Likeable Science. You've helped uh, enrich our audience uh, in terms of their understanding about what it really means to be a scientist, what it really means to do science on a daily basis here. And that's, I, I think, a very valuable lesson for all to learn. And so I, I greatly appreciate your, uh, your, your time, your wisdom, your expertise. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here, Sandy. Aloha. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Excellent. And please join us uh, next week here on Likeable Science. We'll be, we'll be back then. Aloha.